All right. Stella. Stelta. 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 Hi, and joining me today is someone who I've been good friends with for a number of years. And even then I had to ask, what's your surname? Or at least how to pronounce it. Is I'm, I'm joined by my good friend Shimon Stelta. I'd been saying Stetler, so I, I've got that wrong already. But um, you're actually very unlucky because most of Polish names are actually much more complicated than that. So <laughs> this was an easy one, and I still I still didn't manage. Exactly. It. <laughs> so Shimon, thanks for joining me. We've been friends for a while, and we met uh, through the Catholic Church, through Catholic Voices, um, and so we share our faith, and we both have a a story about our journey to where we are today and that's what that's I wanted right. to speak with you about so um, okay. perhaps we could start with you telling us a little bit about yourself what you're doing now and uh, and how where you grew up what it was like when you were raised okay well uh, so well at the moment uh, I live in Cambridge and uh, mm -hmm. I'm a research scientist working for a, for a biopharmaceutical company uh, as a senior scientist. So uh, this is uh, where I am. And uh, I have my own place in here. And I've been living in Cambridge for just over five years. And um, I'm involved with the local parish uh, too, where I'm leading uh, a young uh, adult Catholic group. Um, we have quite a lot of <laughs> young people uh, joining us. So this is a really, really nice community that we are building uh, here. I'm quite connected with the uh, Dominicans. They have a novitiate house here. Um, so I'm in touch with them regularly. I'm very close to the Dominican spirituality uh, myself. So <laughs> this is where I am at the moment. Um, and yes, as you mentioned, um, I'm originally uh, from Poland. I've lived in the UK for about 10 years now. Um, I came here initially just to do a PhD, but kind of stayed yeah, since then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, I always loved science and uh, it's especially biology and more like the application side of biology, so biotechnology, how we can use the knowledge, biological knowledge to make something productive. And, um, and I got really involved in the uh, um, drug discovery industry of um, especially discovering biological drugs uh, and improving them, modifying them and so on. Uh, and uh, I think what really realistically, um, Cambridge is one of the best places in Europe where, uh, where I could <laughs> carry on that work as part of the reasons for that state. Mm. Yeah. So you, you, Shimon, are one of these people that, uh, you know, they say, how can you have faith and be a scientist? Um, and I think you sort of they're discombobulated by someone like you, highly intellectual. And of course, there are there are many, by the way, very intellectual Catholics, Catholic Christians. But you are doing your PhD. You went to Cambridge. You're still at Cambridge now. You're in, in the pharmaceutical industry and you are um, a man of faith. And so Ooh. what I wanted to speak with you about is how you have found a way to reconcile that, because whilst I know and you know that there is no there is no conflict. I think that people see there's a conflict between science and faith and that one either is a man of faith or a man of science or a woman of faith or a woman of science. Um, if I can start at the beginning, if I may, and take you back to Poland, you you were raised in a Catholic that's household, good. is that that's right? Mm -hmm. hmm. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, I was born in the 80s, so... <laughs> uh, Poland was very, very still, very still strongly Catholic. Um, and um, so my family was uh, is practicing um, as well. And so uh, the faith was always there and it was important. It wasn't like super important, I'd say. Like I never really prayed together with my family, even we never said grace before meals or anything. We just would go to church regularly. And uh, sometimes we would talk about God, but not really that much. Um, uh, but you know, it was kind of maybe more kind of cultural Catholicism, I'd say. Um, although still sitting quite close to the heart, something that was kind of ingrained in us, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that was my background. Um, but then I, when I moved to university as well, um, in the years 2000s, um, 
the whole kind of cultural landscape started to shift a little bit in Poland as well. So um, th th there's been a bit of a change towards kind of even anti-Catholicism, um, drawing secular ideas from, from the West mostly, right? So there's been this shift happening already. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's where I started to shift away a little bit, mostly because my faith wasn't really much grounded um, other than that kind of just cultural dimension, right? Um, yeah. The uh, catechesis in Poland is very poor. Uh, you basically end your le lessons as a teenager. So you are presented with this very kind of almost infantile view of the faith. And that's what you're left with. Um, so that, of course, can very easily crumble when, when challenged <laughs> uh, on the intellectual level, right? When you don't have the intellectual foundations of the faith that I discovered only later. Mm. Um, and uh, that was, of course, modeled a little bit with the uh, other aspects of my life and my, you know, growing up and you know, meeting people, building relationships and so on. I started to struggle with some teachings of the church, especially around the uh, sexual ethics. Um, mm. Again, a lot of these things that you learn in Poland, you just you just learn the rules, but you don't really know why, right? Mm. Uh, so either you take it at face value or not. Um, so <laughs> it's it's not great. To, it's not a great place to be, uh, really, if you want to carry on your faith journey. Um, mm. Well, there you go. Um, and then, yeah, and then I when I moved to London to do my PhD, then I think that this this kind of shift. Uh, accelerated, right? Suddenly I found myself in a very secular environment um, among secular friends and I kind of lived that way, <laughs> although uh, I still kept, kept my morals that I <laughs> learned <laughs> as a child, um, but challenging them, right? And um, yeah, I think that's where the shift happened. And, um, and then, then the intellectual doubts uh, started to creep in. Um, when I was being trained as a scientist, when you are being trained as a scientist, uh, especially at the PhD level, um, you you are trained in a very specific way, right? You always try to challenge everything, challenge all the assumptions, uh, challenge hypotheses, trying to find um, explanations uh, behind different mechanisms and so on, right? So um, you, it really sets your mind for a certain way of thinking. And um, one of the mistakes that scientists sometimes do is that they apply that way of thinking to other aspects uh, uh, outside the scientific uh, area, right? Um, but you just do it naturally because that's all, all you know, really, right? Uh, you don't really get any philosophical training at that stage. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's a bit upsetting in a way. But well, there you go. Uh, so I was there, uh, very busy with my PhD. And... Um, I was at this point where, you know, I still would go to church on Sundays and I would sometimes pray because um, I quite like my faith. You know, there's all the good things that <laughs> uh, you might want to like about it, right? It gives you hope, it gives you some promise, uh, mm -hmm. it gives you a bit more meaning. Um, so I liked it, but it was a little bit of an add-on to my life. I lived the, my life the way I wanted um, and uh, I kind of kept it as a, as a little add-on, as I say. Um, well, at this stage, I thought, well, that was a bit unfair, and I need to be honest with myself, and I, I need to decide, you know, either I, I take it, and I take it fully, or either I leave it uh, behind, right? There's no point. I felt like I was like one leg in and one leg out, um, and it just, I just, it just didn't feel honest to me to be in that stage, right? Um, and... Um, the problem I had at that stage was that um, mostly I didn't have time to to think about it, right? Uh, I, my PhD was really overwhelming. I you know, put all my passions aside um, and uh, and I wanted to kind of sit down and dissect my faith. And the first, I didn't have time. Second, I was a little bit afraid to do that because I yeah. thought if I start you know, touching it, it'll just all fall apart. And I still kind of quite like it, right? Uh, so it's going to be two aspects. Yeah, so this is that is what basically happened and where I um, ended up um, in London. So that was my falling away part, if you like. 
I think that's a really interesting point because I think we mustn't be afraid. If we really believe this is true and we do, then we can hold it up to scrutiny and it will withstand. And this is something I've come to realise and I know you have. And it's it's interesting that you say you're worried that if you started picking at it, it would crumble. And in fact, uh, Peter Kreeft always says, uh, I, I'm always talking yeah. about Peter Kreeft, I should get some kickback from him. <laughs> um, um, he, he says oh he's great <laughs> he's fantastic he's fantastic but he, he always says uh, something's only worth believing if it's true that's the only reason to believe anything is because it's true and so we've come to mm. see the truth the goodness and the beauty of our faith um and so actually it sounds like your journey was different but in many ways but similar in others that it was when we started for me i was drilling into the faith into the teachings of the church in a way in all mm. almost in a way to as, I, as I've said before, disabuse people of their silly notions. L let me find out more about what the church teaches to prove how stupid it is and how wrong they are. <laughs> like me, you know, 2000 years of tradition, history, wonderful, um, you know, guided by the spirit, intellect. And here's me going, I'm going to show them. <laughs> I'm going to show them. Their <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Uh, it's so ridiculous. But, a, a but bit of pride. Digging, it's pride. Absolutely pride. Yeah. And that's why when you then do that and you start to dig and you're doing the intellectual work then god starts shifting something in your heart in your spirit that mm. actually um reduces you in a good way this is why i really get that fear of the lord the beginning of wisdom is fear of the lord and people say isn't that terrible god wants you to be scared of him it's not about that it's about recognizing who you are in relation to god and our dependency on god exactly um so that yeah it's more it's more that kind of feeling of awe right yeah. this is often described disciples were often uh filled with awe yeah. when when i don't know let's say during transfiguration right when jesus showed them tells his glorified nature they were terrified um yeah. but um not in that negative sense but with more kind of at all yeah mm. can, can you say something about how your relationship with christ your relationship with god shifted from uh, a sort of dutiful rule following um uh, uh, utilitarian almost I, I like my religion because it's useful it gives me meaning mm. it gives me hope. almost like a, a a sort of tick box um to a personal relationship yeah. a personal encounter um a relationship of love can you can you speak to that yeah sure um so one of the things i struggled um uh, intellectually was uh, the question of miracles as well one of the things mm -hmm. right as, as a scientist like oh we know things like virgin and birds they just don't happen right um uh, so this is uh, this is the thinking i had at that point and then another thing i struggled with was the, the divinity of christ mm -hmm. um and i think many people um come to that point uh who are raised uh, catholic i was kind of scratching my head you know you've got this and a random guy walking around <laughs> and claiming to be God, you would think he's mad, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, like, what was he really, what he claimed to be? And, you know, it was maybe a little bit, you know, over a bit of a stretch. Um, but that's something I struggle with, like, the idea of incarnation and so on. And, uh, and yeah, so that was kind of the background, I think, in the background. I, I, I couldn't, I kind of battled with this a little bit. But again, I just didn't really have much time, right? Uh, to, to tackle it. Um, but then what's happened, um, it's funny how, work, like how God works in your life. Uh, I didn't have time to take it to the intellectual route, so there was this emotional route that came in. And um, I, I just became fascinated with the, with the figure of Christ at some point uh, in my life, which was one of the darkest times of my, my, my life, which I we're not going to describe in detail, <laughs> but it was a difficult time. And at the same time, um, my mom had a very difficult time too. This was, this was when um, my grandma, so my mom's mom, um, was basically at the end of her life. It was the last two years of her life um, when she, she was really fading and uh, becoming weaker and weaker. And my mom was taking care of her. Um, and she really gave all herself to it it was it was incredible to watch um honestly where she was there every day uh to the level where she just couldn't bear it any longer like physically it was difficult mentally it was difficult right um and i remember every time i would go back to poland she would um she would sometimes cry in my arms 
<clears throat> it was quite tough, you know. Uh, but it was amazing because it was she did that because she loved her, right? She wanted to she wanted her to have that dignified end. To um, she she gave everything she could for her mom, and it was it was something unexplainable, right? It was just it was just that pure love, um, like self emptying love, right? And um, I remember she was saying at some point that um, God always gives you such a cross that you can bear. You can't, if you, if God keep, doesn't give you more that you couldn't bear, right? With, um, of course, with his grace. Um, and that every, every suffering has an end, right? So death ends with resurrection. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so... That's when I got a bit puzzled by the figure of Christ because I could see I could see it in her in herself, right? But the way she approached that it was it was like the story of Christ. I could see this, and I understood that it was um, a Good Friday um, when a priest was talking about the self emptying love, that the cross, the image of the cross. Some people think oh, like you know you're in a crucifix with a dead man there, right? But really, this is a this is a mean image of a perfect love, mm-hmm. self emptying love that you completely give yourself away for another person. I could see it in my mom's action. I got it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so at that point, I was like thinking that there is something about it, right? There's mm-hmm. something about it. And then when I moved to Cambridge, that's where basically things started to to change. Um, and uh, I've met some young Dominican. Uh, friars, there's a novice house, as I mentioned, and I got to talk to them, and um, and here they are, you know, 20 years old, young men, um, very intellectually trained, um, often finished studies in Cambridge or Oxford, right, talking about the faith in a way that I've never heard of, um, and uh, leaving everything behind, right, putting the habit on, uh, choosing the life of celibacy, and <laughs> this early age, um, and it, it makes you think. It makes you think. Well, there must be something. I mean, there's something about it that, that people make this radical decision uh, to follow Christ, right? So that's something that puzzled me as well. And then when you start looking uh, at the gospel stories and you start start actually looking at, at at Jesus in the gospels, it's very difficult to square him in into anything. Right. Some people say, oh, it's like a moral teacher and stuff. But, yeah. well, <laughs> it's not really just a moral teacher. He claimed to be God and he did things that are quite extraordinary. And then what happened after all the disciples, they so they were so convinced that what they've seen was true, that all of them except one were tortured to death uh, because they couldn't deny it. <laughs> so there was really something very puzzling about it. So I think that's what eventually made me, uh, made that shift in my head about the uh, incarnation and divinity of Christ. Um, if that makes sense. Um, so that's part of the story. Another part of, of what happened when I moved to Cambridge is um, I went to the chaplaincy here. And again, I, I encountered a lot of young students. Um, some of them as young as 19, right? And they could talk about their faith, referring to Plato and Aristotle, you know, how Thomas Aquinas drew from these philosophies and Christianized them. And, and I, I was just thought, what's going on? <laughs> I've never, never heard of, really, of Thomas Aquinas or anything like this. Uh, I basically discovered the intellectual side of their faith that is really, really strong and very solid. And uh, mm. it was just a, a game changer for me, really. Um, and um, the last thing that had an effect on me in my conversion was um, I started going to a, a Latin mass here. We have a Latin mass in the evening, um, which is a new right mass. But suddenly I, I kind of couldn't really understand what was being said. Yeah. Uh, I kind of knew because I knew the mass, right? I was familiar with it. Um, but uh, I could see how reverent it was. And uh, and. Uh, being there made me feel that there's something really important happening there at that moment. Uh, and that's where I kind of realized uh, the, the real presence. And I felt really humbled. I remember I wanted to leave the church because I felt so 
on the work sheet to be there. I, like suddenly, like I, I would just go there in my trainers, like normal clothes, you know. <laughs> and suddenly I felt so like underdressed for what's happening here and uncomfortable. Um, so yeah, so these are a few things that kind of, um, yeah. yeah shifted my way of thinking and that was only the beginning really <laughs> it's only the beginning of the, of, the, of the journey yeah i think there's something interesting about that no nobody said get out of here with your trainers you've got to go home and get changed but you felt that you were being called to like that there was something you had to adjust and to shift nobody asked you to yeah. do it and we were speaking just earlier this week uh, i was speaking with mark lambert and gavin ashenden about about this that when Pope Francis came in one of the things he did was to say I want to be more simple and get rid of uh, these vestments and uh, have a stay in a simple um, apartment and wear a plain robe and one thing that that I was saying is that I think in a way that's making it more about the man not less because actually the, the the vestments and the cathedral and the architecture and these things point to something transcendent, something beyond. So if we strip those away, then then what we're saying is actually I'm making it about me. So the very thing that I think, you know, this is just my assessment that the Holy Father was doing to make it more simple was actually making it more about the man and not the office. Um, and so you recognise that transcendence yeah. that you were in the presence so of the Holy. More... Sorry. Yes, absolutely. So but you are there, and then well, what happens is uh, the structure is different, right? The the, the church is, is really beautiful. Um, mm. So it's it's set apart from the from the secular world. Mm. The vestments uh, are set apart from the from the secular world, and the language itself was set from this this one spoken one. It's like kind of set, uh, had it had another level of of, of sacredness and. Mm. Uh, and what well, is for me, this is when these things clicked, right? And with incense and the, with reverence, with, where basically words were less important, but actions were pointing to what was happening there. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. It's It reminds me a bit of that interview Bishop Barron did recently with Shia, Shia LaBeouf. I don't know if uh, I said that right. Shia uh, LaBeouf. <laughs> don't know. I've heard but, of him, yeah. So he, so he, by all accounts, was a, a going through a terrible time. He's been accused of terrible things. He said he's been selfish and done all these awful things. I don't know the extent of it, but that he went to the Latin Mass, and like you, he spoke of not not necessarily understanding on that intellectual level what was being said, but this this presence of the Holy, this presence of God, washed over him. He's converted to Catholicism, as far mm -hmm. as I know, and it was through his experience of the Latin Mass, and I find it especially interesting, and this isn't some kind of church politics, me mm. praising the Latin Mass, because, you know, I, I love Mass, I love in, in all its forms, any access point through the Mass to Christ uh, and the real presence, but it, it's interesting for you as a man of science that I think that we're desperate, aren't we, and especially in the modern world, to be able to explain everything away, to be able to, this sort of scientism to be able to reduce everything and explain mm. it. And then you came up against some difficulties and some challenging times in your life where you realised science can only go so far. And there's the human heart calls for something more, something transcendent. And in fact, you can only do science because you accept certain philosophical presuppositions. And this is what worries me about you saying there's no philosophy in science. I feel it should be compulsory that the study of science should be accompanied by philosophical study yeah. absolutely I, I i was really upset by my um my, my uh colleagues uh, students at university because many of them were quite technocratic like they, they really focused on the molecular biology that was kind of you know the god of uh of science right and all the other subjects that we had we did have philosophy for half a year and a half a year ethics they're laughing at it honestly yeah um it, yeah it was it, it was really upsetting they didn't treat it seriously at all um yeah and like, we had some economy classes project management they didn't think it was important at all um all that mattered was this kind of uh you know uh, hard science if you like anything else so it's not only religion it was <laughs> humanities you know they would they would actively laugh at it so but it tells more about them than uh, actual um, or 
in in the philosophical training, but also ethics. I mean, mm. now when I look at this, you know, you train people how to modify DNA, um, and uh, mm. we can do it pretty easily nowadays with the new methods. Mm. Um, but you're not really trained <laughs> uh, in the ethical field no. uh, at all. So, and this and this is the problem is um... it, it, it seems to be quite actually mind blowing if you think about it. Well, it does because <clears throat> it's it's like with great power comes great responsibility. This this idea that, that if you if you just like they're laughing, you said they're they're just laughing at this study of philosophy and ethics. Like, why are we doing this? Let's just get through it. But in fact, um, if you get rid of that final end, if you don't know why you're doing something, you just can. Mm. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. You can create an atomic bomb, but you don't Absolutely. know whether you should drop it or not. You can use plastic surgery to heal war wounds or to create big breasts what where's the value judgment and and to to ignore that and to say that doesn't matter mm -hmm. seems alarming to me sorry we're having a we've had a few connection issues so uh this if it's jumpy you know why but i'm gonna we're gonna persevere aren't we shimon um and one of the things i said to you uh, near the beginning is that there is a tendency for people to think that you are either scientific or you're a you're a person of faith that that um some people think that the two can't be reconciled. Uh, I know uh, Saint Pope John Paul II wrote in Fides et Ratio, faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. And I know that's something that you can speak about. Do you want to say a little bit more about that as how you, how you reconcile the two? Yes, sure. Uh, it's funny because after my conversion, I've noticed I had a few people like when they would I don't know, either they knew me uh, as a scientist at work, right, and they would find out that I'm a Catholic, and they were like, oh, but like, how can you be religious? <laughs> or, or sometimes I would meet people, like, I don't know, or the street or whatever. I was like, once I spoke to, spoke to one homeless person to come out for breakfast, and then was asking what I was doing, and I said that I was a scientist, and uh, and then was like, so what did you do in the church? Because <laughs> I was in the church. Um, so that's quite funny. So yeah, there's definitely this uh, conception, which is really sad. And I think um, I think the main reason why people think that these things don't go together, I mean, just, just multiple reasons, but I think it boils down to understanding of science, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and even many scientists don't think about what science is, what's the limitation of science and uh, the proper area. and um, even the methods of investigation, they don't necessarily uh, think about them, right? They just mm. do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I think it really boils down. So when I talk about it, I usually try to uh, start with sciences and, um, and, uh, and, and try to explain that, well, science really uh, is, is just this area we can apply empirical um, methods to describe the natural world, right? Uh, so you're looking for natural explanations of natural phenomena <clears throat> within the natural world, okay? Uh, and that, of course, has its limitations, uh, naturally. Uh, first of all, like you can study uh, the brain cells or the heart cells, and you can understand, you know, how how they work on the molecular level, how they communicate with each other, so you can understand how they work, but uh, it's not going to tell you what love is, right? <laughs> or if you uh, study, um, you can study life at the very uh, molecular level as well, um, but you'll never find out what life is about and what's the purpose of life and its meaning. And um, you can, yeah, you can study the universe using astrophysics, uh, but uh, it's not going to tell you why there's something rather than nothing at the first place. Uh, so there's a, a lot of things that are uh, very relevant to our life, if not sometimes more relevant, right? Uh, I think it's Albert Einstein who said that um, not everything that can be counted counts, not everything yeah. that counts can be counted. <laughs> um, and, um, and I quite like that, right? Uh, so things like beauty, uh, morality, oh yeah, science will never tell you um, what's evil, what's good, because it's completely outside of its scope. Uh, yeah, you can't you can't 
use make an experiment to to decide that Nazis are evil or the sunset is beautiful. <laughs> You'll never reach these con conclusions using um, empirical tools. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what about? Sorry to interrupt. What about to people who say, well? what's beautiful for one person is different for another and what's good for one person this cultural relativism this moral relativism because i think that's really problematic in our culture in our society tell me why this is problematic and why actually objective truth is necessary especially in the realm of morals uh well uh so this um subjectivism um which is horrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's really widespread, as you say. And uh, yes, it easily touches these uh, areas where it's maybe a bit more difficult to see objectivity, right, in morality or beauty and so on. But as you can see, uh, people take that subjectivism even further, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and they say what's true for me uh, might not be true for you. And nowadays, even biological sex, right, which yeah. is the uh, very common in, the, in modern discussions or um, anything really, uh, even like factual items, uh, physical items, not just non-physical or metaphysical. Um, so I think it's a wider problem, um, and not only to, touching the... People have to realise what, what it is that they're really saying, what is the end point of what they're saying? Yeah. Because if you start to say, well, there is no such thing as objective truth and it's just what's true for me, then it's not obvious why we could condemn anything anything that we find morally abhorrent, uh, child rape, um, mm -hmm. genocide. Well, it's not, it's not clear that why that would be wrong if you follow that line of thinking. And I'm not sure people really want to say that, but they find yeah. themselves saying it. That's a good point. Uh, coming back to the uh, science and faith debate, um, I'm quite passionate about this. Go ahead. <laughs> Go. Go. <laughs> yeah, so one thing I, I try to point out, what's the actual space for science, right? And the area and the limitations that you can, you can draw. And um, then what you've noticed, um, there's two things. Um, first uh, is that uh, science is looking for natural explanations, as I mentioned, right? Mm. And uh, it's using empirical method for that. Uh, that you can't apply for things that are outside, like morality, right? Um, but scientists often, and like why there's public as well, they um, they they take that um, assumption, uh, which is called, uh, to be more kind of specific, it's called uh, methodological naturalism, right? So um, they take it further and they make an assumption that all the causes in the, in the world mm. uh, are natural, uh, so everything has a natural cause, right. right? That excludes, of course, supernatural or some miracles and yeah. so on, um, and reduce the reality to the material world. There's nothing more than the physical reality, right? So these, you need to realize that these uh, statements are philosophical statements, they are no longer scientific statements, right? Um, so this is where we extrapolate the uh, method methodological naturalism, which is good. This is how we study sciences. <laughs> we need it. When you extrapolate and you say that actually everything is a natural cause, it's no longer science, you're doing philosophy. People don't know they're doing philosophy and they're not trained in the philosophy. I'm not trained, I'm a complete adept. <laughs> but it's useful to at least see it, right? And mm -hmm. at least be aware that at this moment, you're actually making a philosophical claim no longer a scientific claim. Um, so that's one thing. Um, another thing, another thing, you know, when you study uh, uh, science, right, and you use these natural methods, uh, sorry, uh, empirical methods, mm -hmm. study the natural world, what can become actually quite puzzling is that the world is intelligible, that it, yeah. it can be studied like that, that it's ordered. And uh, as when I was back my, during my PhD, right, I could really see these molecular mechanisms in action and it's incredible how mathematical they are you know you can put them in a graph and they it all joins very nicely and uh, you can see how the world is kind of almost orchestrated right it's, it's very mathematical very ordered and and uh, and it is puzzling if you think about it because why is it like that if it just popped into existence just like that uh, you know some kind of chaotic forces you'd probably expect it to be chaotic not ordered right but it is the, the laws are fixed 
the world is intelligible uh, and it seems to be as if it's like a reflection of a certain perfection. So it can actually lead you to God. That's why I, myself, when I was doubting, I never shifted fully into atheism because I could mm -hmm. see the beauty of creation at this molecular level. And it just prevented me to, to shift fully into atheism. Um, yeah, definitely that idea of the world being intelligible, that you couldn't do science if there weren't fixed laws of nature um the idea that it's just a random um and i think who's the guy who who said if you give enough chimps <laughs> chimps enough time to type they'll type the complete works of shakespeare um that the idea that it, you know it's just we just happen to live in an ordered universe by chance um mm. and i think I, I can't remember who it was but i think on his deathbed or near his deathbed he said actually that's rubbish and that that wouldn't happen um, and actually, the chances that we live in an ordered universe by chance are so remote as to not be acceptable to a scientist, as to not be believable. Mm. Well, I think, yeah, it, again, I'm not an expert in this field, but uh, if some, cause some people talk about the idea of multiverse, right, and then you've got multiple universes and yeah. each with its own laws, and then we, just, of course, are in the one that... Um, got it right uh, that ha got it right if you like yeah. <laughs> of course that's where we are but um speaking to physicists um recently this is this is not a mainstream mm -hmm. uh, physical idea that's what i uh, understand that um mm. hypothesis and we don't really have any emperor for proof uh, don't quote you on that <laughs> no, <laughs> okay <laughs> won't, won't get you to sign anything uh, but i i think this is <laughs> i think um this is the thing that uh, so i i'm particularly interested in young people in teaching young people like you know i'm a teacher i have been for over 20 years oh, yes. and i encounter this in the classroom first of all they don't realize that the conditions are so perfect for life to exist that if they had been even remotely slightly different there mm. would be no life on earth that it's unbelievable they don't even know this um yeah so there's several uh, f physical constants right mm. and uh if you move them a little bit then atoms would enjoy properly or stuff like that so yeah uh, yeah but they also come to me absolutely sure and i find it amusing to <laughs> i mean i don't i don't want to say i wind my students up but i question them so they'll say oh when we do creation so for example when we're doing about the creation story in genesis often they're not interested they become interested but they begin disinterested because they're like well science tells us all the answers this is just an old fairy tale and it's pointless and the theory of evolution come on miss get with it and then i say to them oh i'm, I'm not too sure about the theory of evolution can you tell me about it and then they say, well, yeah, and they start to look around a bit shifty. Um, <laughs> there were apes and then they became humans. Oh, really? There were, there were apes who became humans. Can you tell me a bit more about that? And suddenly they realise that they've just, they've just been fed this and they just repeat it. Now, this isn't a question about whether evolution is true, or, or but it's a, the point is they're very happy to swallow and to accept these ideas without question, but mm -hmm. then, and, and to dismiss uh religious claims or to misunderstand and not to push further uh that when you drill down they don't know they don't know you know <laughs> so it's just encouraging them to to think so the creation stories for example we go when we look at those we say actually what it doesn't matter whether you find the fossils of adam and eve it doesn't matter uh, whether there was a garden and if you can't find it it wasn't true because there are there are truths rooted deeply in that story it's a story told to reveal a deeper truth and the only way it can be revealed is through story and is it or is it not true you know that that, that, that men and women are different and complementary com i always struggle with this word complementary uh, and i talk about the boy who cried wolf and i say whether we find a boy on a hill the dead bones of a boy and all the sheep and the villagers and the pitchforks they use to run up the hill is irrelevant is it or is it not true that if you lie, people will lose faith in you? Is it or is it not true that you have to watch for danger around you? Oh, yes. Yeah, miss. Actually, that is true. So you, so this idea, this sudden, this kind of realisation that you can learn deep truths through story, through narrative, without having to say it's false because it's scientifically false. There are other ways oh, of absolutely. truth. Uh, you need to approach each text 
Ooh, I can hear myself. Oh, that's annoying. Hey, wait, wait, wait. It's fine now. I don't know. <laughs> that was a bit of a glitch. Um, need to approach it, each text uh, accordingly to, to its genre, right? Uh, you, you wouldn't read Peter Pan and then suddenly go around the world trying to find him or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> or you wouldn't take the... Uh, uh, It'd be a big waste uh, of time oh. if you did. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Although, maybe think of people playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, don't. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, when you read Shakespeare, right, you, you, you read it according to what, what he written it for and like, right? The yeah. same in the Bible, you've got many different genres. You've got parables, you've got gospels that itself, different genre. You've got uh, historical books and uh, and you've got the things like the story of Genesis, which clearly is it's not a scientific 3Ds and it's never meant to be, right? No. Um, uh, but does it, so again, like, do these stories about Peter Pan uh, transmit any truth? Of course, they yeah. Valid, right. The same, we can still learn something from the story of Genesis, which is that the world is ordered towards God, created yeah. by God, for God. And um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, always a little, I laugh a little bit. Um, um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can actually add something interesting to what you said uh, about your students um, well, accepting the, the theory of evolution. I'm mm -hmm. glad they do so. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, as you as you notice, they take it uh, as on the on based on faith, right? Well, that, that's it. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, so, so so that 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 it shows you a little bit more the nature of faith. So faith is it's something that we all do, right? Um, I don't know, but before you sit on the chair, you don't check the integrity of it uh, you know, or structural integrity. You just sit on it. You believe it's not going <laughs> to fall apart, right? You go to the doctor. It tells you to take this drug. Do you go and check all the scientific, mm -hmm. scientific literature behind it to see if it's the right drug for you, blah, blah, blah. You just believe the scientist that's right. Mm -hmm. So um, it's basically faith is believing on the, the word of the word of a bit of a witness, right? Yeah. Um, and then the only diff, so that's what uh, Saint Augustine would say, and yeah. we all we all have to have faith, otherwise we would not be able to function in the normal world. Um, but what Saint John Henry Newman adds is that what's different about the religious faith is not the act of faith; it's subject, right? So we believe the te theological truths, uh, but they are revealed to us um, by God. <clears throat> uh so it is divine divine revelation that we accept right as we accept the, the words of dr uh, a gp who prescribes a, a medicine right so it's a, it's a similar act it's just the the the, the, the subject is different um, yeah no that's brilliant i think so so important to hear as well um and also this idea that um it's it needs to be universal and i i think i think it's all very well saying, well, science will give us all the answers. But let's be honest, the sort of creature we are, we can't access those. It, very few are able to access. I'm thinking as, I mean, I'm keeping up with you-ish. Uh, no, I am. I'm keeping up with you on your site. And I do when we discuss things. But it reminds me of when I was young and my brother, who's a chemical engineer, used to help me with my maths because I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at maths. And we used to sit in the kitchen and he'd help me and he'd get really frustrated because he'd say, what are you doing looking out the window at squirrels? <laughs> and I, I was just looking at the squirrels running up the tree. And he said, I'm trying to teach you maths. You've got to listen and pay attention. But my attention was drawn elsewhere. And I think if we, it, it's great to be able to explain things scientifically, but it is not accessible. And neither is it, no, I don't mean to be uh, rude, but it's not, it doesn't hold our interest. So if you think of a uh, 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 a boxing match this is something Jonathan Pajot talks about he says if you're watching a football match or a boxing match and you and the the commentator comments about what's happening in a scientific fashion and describes a punch now the neurons are firing extending the arm the blood vessels and it would take about two hours just to describe one punch and although factually <laughs> correct although it's factually correct it's mm. not, it doesn't hit us. It doesn't connect with us in the same way as he absolutely smashed him in the face and he fell to the ground. He's out for the count. One, two, three. And everyone's glued to the set. Now, both are true, but one has more meaning and it connects on a, in a way that the other perhaps doesn't, certainly for many people. 
but is nevertheless true, but true in a different mm -hmm. way. So I think if we're demanding that um, God, the Bible, religion has to be, uh, you have to have a level of scientific proof, you're, you're, you're sort of ignoring the sort of creature we are. You're, you're pretending we're something we're not, I think. Well, it's more like you're, you're misusing science. And uh, well, if you think about it, you, if you require a scientific proof for something that lies outside of the scientific inquiry, mm. you can't have one, right? Because that's yeah. the thing. Like God is not like a creature among many creatures. Right? It's being itself that just holds everything in existence. <laughs> you can't have a scientific proof for that. And... Um, it doesn't mean that there's no proof of what exists. Of course not. There's no scientific one. There's no scientific proof for, I don't know, some moral uh, actions, right? We have philosophical proofs for that. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I always get a bit annoyed when people do that because they try to then find God within the natural world. Like if we have like a squirrel, we've got a tree, and then there's God, right? <laughs> and yeah. here's the, the experiments that we've done to, to find him. Um, yeah. And, and also the very the very creature that we are that we can step outside to examine tells us something that again connects with that genesis story about being created in the image of god mm -hmm. the image and likeness of god that we are unlike any other creature that we're able to to do that to you know to be able to study and to be able to reflect this is part of what pope saint john paul ii says in fides et ratio is this faith and reason reason is so important but we're the only creature able to do this Yes, absolutely. It's, uh, I'm smiling a little bit because I, uh, I've seen some of the uh, posts of my scientist friends. Uh, I remember there was a evolutionary tree, uh, mm -hmm. the entire one, which is quite impressive with all these different uh, uh, branches, right? Yeah. Um, all the way from small bacteria to, through the uh, fungi and, and all the animals and plants, massive branching and it's a little tiny branch there it's like humans <laughs> this is where we are you know it's like it's part of this and, you know mm. like so meaningless yeah uh in in the face of all these other creatures but then I, in my they're mind, the ones I... who drew the tree not the dolphins <laughs> yes exactly because then in my mind i kind of reorganized it into kind of blocks. So you've got one block of all the all the creatures that uh, are not really um, sentient or, or, or conscious. Mm -hmm. Then they've got a smaller stage too, if you like another block of, which is the apps to a certain degree, uh, self-conscious, right? Like higher animals and so on. And then you've got the uh, the very top level is humans that have cultural language, moral responsibilities and so mm -hmm. on. So there's only one species that fits into that box and then yes, if you <laughs> rearrange it present in that way then yeah we are unique of course um mm -hmm. so yeah it's uh it is it's funny <laughs> well thank god for you shimon and i think it's wonderful i know that you do you give talks um as well as the work that you're doing you're very busy uh you've had a program on radio maria and as far as possible and i know your work limits this but as far as possible you try to reach out into the culture and and speak about these things and um i hope one day we're able to get you into school and talk to our young people but i'm very glad to have met you i'm very glad to know you and thank you so much for joining me today thank you oh that would be great i would love that <laughs> <laughs> all right god bless until we meet again bye okay see you later bye bye